Hi, so I'm just going to quickly go through the f results in the fractal exercise that um, hope you've had a chance to run. I'll just um, go through the, the sheet relatively quickly just to point out the relevant uh, issues. Um, so we run through a bit of the introduction. We just we show what the Mandelbrot set is mathematically. It's um, it's this recurrence relation that you you, you keep going, and um, if if it diverges, if it explodes, then uh, that um, point is outside of the Mandelbrot set, and if it doesn't explode, if it converges, the point is inside. But for the purpose of this exercise, it doesn't really matter. All that matters, uh, and we'll come back to this, is that this calculation is very uh, badly load imbalanced. It means that different points uh, can take largely, uh, can be very, very different amounts of time to compute, and I'll, I'll reiterate that later on. So um, we'll see, we discover a bit more what a task farm is here which hope to be covered in the lectures anyway. And the idea, uh, I introduced the load and balance factor here, which again we'll come back to. It's a way of trying to quantify um, how well load balanced um, a calculation was. You have different processes doing different work. Some of them may take longer than the others. You'd like them all to take the same time. If some take longer than others, you're always waiting for the, for, the, for the slowest one to finish. And this quantifies that. It's the workload of the most loaded worker divided by the average, but most importantly, it tells you how much faster the program could have gone. So if the load and balance factor is two, if the most loaded worker took twice as long as the average, then if you, you can see that if you load balanced it perfectly, your calculation could go twice as fast. And the exercise gives us a chance to, to look at that quantitatively. So the exercise I distributed uh, on the website as, as a, tar file, a tar file, and you should be able to run it. I've got some sample outputs here on the sheet, but again, I'll go through these a bit more detail in the lecture. Um, and so hopefully um, that made sense. You're able to run it and get some um, some results. There's a lot of parameters here which you can alter, which are mainly for fun, to be honest. The Julia set gives you prettier answers and such like. But I'm not so bothered about that. I'm really going to concern with, with how this illustrates load imbalance and how we can, we can um, look at the effects, the pros and cons um, of balancing the load. So um, and the fundamental um, issue um, is that to balance the load, you need to have more tasks than you have processes, and we'll illustrate that again. So I've got a lecture now to go through some of the, hopefully the results, the similar results to what you would have found. So outcomes for the fractals lecture. So what I did is I ran it for a fixed number of workers. So so we're, the idea here is that we've got, say, for example, 16 workers. Uh, that actually requires you to run 17 processes. It's still what only one node of Archer. 17 processes because in, in the, 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 the naive implementation of the task farm, you have a process dedicated to being the, <coughs> the controller. The controller has to send out all the work. So, so if you want to run on 16 workers, you need 17 processes. What I did is I started with the minimum number of tasks, which is the same number, size as the number of workers. So that's um, task size is 192 by 192. Um, and we'll see in the picture that corresponds to a, a perfect tiling of, of, of the 768 by 768 domain into 16 tasks in a 4x4 four four grid. And it took almost two seconds with load and balance factor of 5. And as we increase the number of tasks, we have more tasks than we have processes, more tasks than we have workers. Um, then the, 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 the time starts to drop. The load and balance factor always drops. We'll see that actually right at the extreme end where we have a task size of two by two, or right right down to one by one pixel, a single a task is a single pixel. The time starts to go up again, and we'll discuss why that is. But it's actually most illustrative for this example if you fix the number of, of workers, I fix the number of processes, and for that try and load balance it by increasing the number of tasks, I decreasing the task size. So. <coughs> Just to um, jump ahead to actually, this is this is what you would have seen: 16 workers and 16 tasks. The output is coloured so that the, the shading. So we try and show you the Mandelbrot set here, but the shading shows you the tasks. So all these have go from dark to light, and that shows you these were all done by different workers. Um, so the the task is shaded according to the worker that that performed that task. If we have 16 workers and 16 tasks, by definition, because they're handed out, um, each task will do a different each worker will do a different task they'll be shaded differently and we see the figures we got here but you'll see that uh, if you remember from the introductory lecture the most important point is these 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 um uh points inside the mandelbrot set have take a long time to compute because we keep going and going and going and we say all oh, after 5 10,000 iterations it didn't diverge that means it's in the mandelbrot set but these diverge very quickly. So these are, these are easy to compute and these are hard. So you can see that, for example, the way it was blocked up, 
this process here, which is probably number naught one, this worker naught one, two, three, four, five, worker six, seven, eight, nine, ten, workers nine and ten would have had a lot of work to do, and workers zero and fifteen almost nothing. So not surprisingly there's a very large load imbalance here. The 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 the, the um total worker load was this large number, which is what, um four hundred and ninety eight million. Um uh, but the important point is the average worker load was um here um thirty one million but the maximum was 156 million, and that ratio is about five. That's where you get the load and balance factor. And in fact, the minimum worker load was very, very low at all. So some of these guys had almost nothing to do at all. So you can see from the stats that's very poorly load balanced, and that gives you this initial point here. But as we increase uh, the number of tasks, the tasks get smaller, uh, the time reduces, but increases at the end. We'll come back to that, and the load and balance factor always pretty much decreases. So how can we use this to make predictions? Well, what you can say is with 16 tasks, it took 1.93 seconds, the load and balance factor was 5. That says that with a perfectly load balanced um, calculation, i.e. a very large task count, we would predict theoretically it should go 5 times faster, which would be 1.93 over 5 is 0 0.38, almost 0 0.4 seconds. But we can also make predictions for the intermediate points, because we say, well, if we have 64 tasks, where we saw the load and balance factor, if we go back 64 tasks, load and balance factor was 1.5, and it took 0.59 seconds. Well, the load and balance factor is 1.5. The predicted time is the perfect time times the load and balance factor. Just, 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 just as the perfect time is the measured time divided by the load and balance factor, the predicted time is the perfect time times the load and balance factor. And so we would predict that with a load and balance factor of 1.5, and the perfect time was 0.38, as worked out here, times 1.5 is 0 0.575, 0 0.58 seconds. And we measure 0.59, so that's actually quite a, a good um, a good match. So what I've done on this, this next slide is I've plotted the execution time take. I've, I've done more points here than on the on the table, but I've, I've run the program and plotted the execution time. Starts off at almost 2 seconds, drops down to this 0.4, which was our prediction. And you'll see that our predicted time and, and the actual execution time um, work out pretty well. So in this intermediate range of quite a large number of tasks, but not a huge number, we, we predict, we get that's almost the right number, we predict that it will take about 0.4 seconds. We, we, our prediction is very good. But up here at the end, there's this increase. And why is there this increase? Well, our prediction doesn't take into account communications. It assumes that the communications overhead is zero. Now, remember, the way it works is that the, the, the controller takes a task, gives it out to a worker, the worker does it and gives it back. That is going to have a cost. Now, <coughs> if we have relatively chunky tasks with hundreds of pixels, that cost is going to be negligible. We give a task out. It takes maybe a few microseconds to do that. Um, the, the the worker works on it for a long time and comes back. You know that that overhead of distribution is 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 is, is almost negligible. But when we're giving out very very small tasks, two by two, and here a single pixel at a time, we give a a worker a single pixel to do. It works on it and gives it back. There's going to be a huge overhead of toing and froing the communications. So this illustrates that, and it was this was mentioned very early on in the course, for small tasks small numbers of tasks or large tasks themselves, um, small tasks count, <coughs> the loadout imbalance, there isn't enough parallelism or the load imbalance dominates, but for a large number of tasks, a very small grain size, as we might call it, the, the communications dominate. So we're looking for some uh, minimum here. And the reason that the communications don't dominate until these very, very large numbers of tasks is because Archer is a very efficient machine and, and the, the and the, the communications overhead is very small. On a different machine, you might see this this upturn happening at a smaller a smaller number. Just so we showed this picture earlier, but pictorially, what happens when we increase the number of tasks or a fixed number of workers? Why do we get better load balance? Well, we'll see here that if we have 64 tasks and 16 workers, in principle each worker could do four tasks, but that's not what happens. You'll see that the first 16 tasks, which are the bottom two lines, are given out sequentially, so that's why that the, each of these tasks is done by a different worker. Then you can see that um, some of the workers get stuck. If we look at it, so what happens is some of the workers, the workers that get the tasks which are in this, this black region, they're very difficult, they get stuck. They just carry on doing them. And so up here you'll see that, in fact, uh, one of the, the workers, it turns out it looks like it's a worker, 16, it's hard to tell, 15, 16, 
based on the colouring picks up all the tasks at the end because everyone else is doing some hard tasks and that that's what load balancing means if somebody's doing a hard task and taking a lot of a lot of work people who have finished can pick up all the easy tasks so you can see for example that <coughs> Um, basically almost all the workers got picked up some hard tasks in this region they're, they're divvied out in this in this order bottom left sweeping across through to the top right and then at the end whoever was free just picked up all those picked up all the spare tasks but it looks like even when they finished some people were still working so the load and balance factor is 1.5 we say we could actually do a bit better than this <coughs> Excuse me. If we increase the number of tasks much higher than 64, you can plot the pictures, but they get quite hard to interpret. So again, that illustrates that point, the key graph here, that the execution time drops. It matches our prediction, which comes from measuring how much work each, uh, how much uh, work there was for each worker to do. Uh, but up at the extreme end, when the tasks become very small, we've, neg we've neglected the communications overhead in our, in our simple model, and, and the, the time goes up again. The other thing you can do, which possibly isn't so interesting, but I'll cover it, is basically to say, well, we'll take a fixed number of tasks, but we'll increase the number of workers. So what we're saying is we'll say, we'll just stick with, um, I took the 64 tasks, and we'll run on 4 up to 64 workers. So this is trying to show that actually, unless you load balance your calculation, there's no point throwing lots of processes at it, because because it's just not worth it. So you'll see that as we increase the number of workers, the load and balance factor gets bigger, and the time drops but reaches a reaches a plateau. Better shown with a graph, um, the time um, plateaus because basically we're saying above about 16 workers, there's no point throwing more workers at this problem because one of the workers is going to get a task which is so hard it's going to take all the time the other ones are just going to spin away and pick up the easy ones and so unless we have small tasks we can't distribute the hard tasks to multiple workers so you can see above about 16 workers the load and balance factor just shoots up and, and you'll see the time just stays constant so that's again trying to illustrate that unless you load balance your problem well, there's no point throwing lots of workers at it because they're just they're just not they're just not utilized effectively. So the key points, <coughs> I'll just summarize them. This task firm is also known as the master worker controller worker <coughs> excuse me. Um um pattern allows a master process to distribute work to set of worker processes. Um we have a dedicated master or controller uh, um, responsible for creating, distributing, gathering the individual jobs. It can improve the load balance by using more tasks than workers, but with some overhead. And we'll see at the extreme case when we have a, hu a vast number of tasks, many more number of workers, uh, that overhead did come significant. And the load balance adversely affects performance, especially the number of processes increases. So we see if you have poor load balance, there's no point throwing number of processes at it. So these tasks are units of work. We can, in principle, vary them in size. Um, each task won't have a consistent execution time, and the, and the Mandelbrot set is chosen to ex basically to, to, to exploit that, or, or to be an extreme example of that. Two tasks next to each other can take very, very uh, varying, extremely varying amounts of time to process. The queues, the way it works, the master generates a pool of tasks and puts them into a queue and gives them out to the workers, and the workers are assigned dynamically um, a task from the queue whenever they become available. So load balancing is really a way of determining how, how well our, our work is distributed across these workers, which in a real program could be processes or threads. This was an MPI program, so it had to be processes. If we, if we successfully load balance, we don't have idle processes and we don't overload a particular core. But poor load balancing leads to underutilized cores reducing performance. And it's showing that, you know, if we think about how much cost, when we run a job, it costs us. We have to, we reserve and pay for all these processes for all this time. Uh, we have a finite budget on, on tightly controlled systems like Archer. A researcher will be given a finite budget of time. And so load balancing is one way of assuring, ensuring that we make optimal use of those time and avoiding wasting resources. I think that the, that the final um, point is the most important one. You know, is it necessary to run this on 4,000 cores or could it be run on 2,000 more efficiently? A lot of people just jump in and say, well, I'll use the maximum number of cores I can. It'll scale up to that, won't it? Well, we'll see that here, uh, in this case, if we fix the number of um, um, tasks, we, so we don't make an effort to load balance, there's no point throwing more workers at it because the time just becomes uh, plateaus. Because uh, we've got constant time but more workers, this costs us more money.
you know, it costs us more processor hours to do this calculation. So that's a very important point. So when you get onto a, a new system, one of the first things you do is you take a, a very representative calculation and just explore the parameters of space to find out for this particular calculation, you know, is it worth running on large numbers of processes? If not, why not? Can I balance the load better? Can I reduce the overheads? So I hope that was useful um, um, and, and I've covered an exercise. I hope you found running that useful and you get some quite nice pretty pictures out from the, from the Mandelbrot set.